Um, now to the event proper, I just want to thank Jordan Piatigorsky for being here with us today to discuss the Science Fantasies Trilogy. Um, they're great books. Uh, I haven't read the newest one, but I have read the second one because I was honored enough to blurb it. So I had a, a great chance to read it in advance and share some, it's a, it's a wonderful book and I was really honored that he asked me to be, be, be a blurber for that book itself. And then he's going to be joined today by editor Lucy Chumley. Um, and uh, I guess, uh, oh, I, I did want to mention too that we are giving out a free audio book um, a free audiobook of Jordan's essay collection, Truth and Fantasy, um, and all you have to do is put your email address on there and they will send you the information to download the audiobook. So please do that if you're interested. You do it anyway. You should be interested. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, Lucy, I'm going to hand it off to you now, and Jordan, I'm going to give you this mic that I have here. So. Okay, great. Thank you. Hi, everybody, and welcome. Um, I just wanted to do a very brief introduction. Um, yeah, okay, I need to hold it closer, that's all. So I just wanted to give you a very brief introduction to Joram. Many of you know Joram already, um, but personally I find long introductions a little bit um, awkward, so I'm just going to hit some of the high points. Um, Joram is a scientist um, by uh, training. He's a molecular biologist and eye researcher. Um, and he founded the Laboratory of Molecular and Developmental Biology at the National Eye Institute of the National Institutes of Health. And he also is a recipient of the Helen Keller Prize for Vision Research. And he's written numerous uh, scientific articles and including a, a co-editing a science book, which is Molecular Biology of the Eye, Genes, Vision, and Ocular Disease. So this is all his um, scientific background. But what's interesting and really cool about Joram is that before he um, finished up his career in science, he decided that he wanted to write. And so he spent, uh, he, he started uh, out writing short stories and essays, and then uh, he published his first um, work of fiction, which is Jellyfish Have Eyes. Um, he's gone on to write a memoir, The Speed of Dark, and he's published several collections of essays and short stories, um, including one where he looks at death from all angles, which is very interesting, including imagining where the protagonist uh, actually attends his own funeral, which that's an interesting little collection. Um, so today we're really here to talk about the trilogy that he's written. The first one was Jellyfish Have Eyes. They're all here, Jellyfish Have Eyes. Second one, Roger's Thought Particles. And the third one, Regina's Imagination Universe. And this is the Science Fantasies Trilogy. So, and I hope you can hear me. Okay. Um, so they have some things in common. Um, all of them are set in the future. All three of the protagonists are scientists and researchers, and they're all related. They're all descendants of the same family, but sometimes with a gap of, what is it, 100 years between Roger and, and Ricardo? Even a little bit more. <laughs> so they're, they're sort of set in the future. And all three of them um, explore big ideas that I hope we're going to dig into a little bit. And so what's interesting for us here in Bethesda is that they're all set or anchored in the world of scientific research. Um, AKA the Fictional Vision Science Center, which is located right here in the Bethesda of the future. And so the setting of the novels, um, the Vision Science Center is kind of an interesting place and it's the setting for all three of the books and also um, gives a flavor of the world of scientific research, which is really, uh, runs throughout them. And so I just wanted to read a little section from the first uh, book, Jellyfish Have Eyes, that talks about the world of nature, which is from a distance. This is when the pr protagonist, Ricardo, is um, going out looking for jellyfish. It says, from a distance, the tranquil tree-lined bay looked like a postcard. Well, maybe not that peaceful. He imagined drama beneath the soft skin of the sea, 
sharks hunting seals, and turtles prowling for jellyfish, nature's beauty often camouflaged the ugly reality of survival. And so the ugly reality of survival um, is what I wanted to talk about. And that is the setting of the, the world of scientific research. And so I really wanted to ask you first, Joram, uh, how important is it to write what you know, do you think? Because you were in this world, and it's so beautifully represented across this series with all its little intrigues and. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's kind of stereotyped to write what you know. Teachers and instructors always say that it's it's true. You have to write what you know. But um, another way of looking at it is that. Uh, that's the only thing you can write. I mean, how are you gonna write something you don't know? So rather than hunt around what is it that I know that I can write about, I would say that the idea is, is to write, just to write and be authentic. And it cannot help but be about something that you know. And the beauty of it is that as you write, at least in my case, that it turns out that each of the things that you thought you knew and that you did know at a certain level suddenly becomes a little more complex than you had imagined. And ideas come to you that you never would have thought of. And the characters become three-dimensional. And the, the setting becomes a little different than what you knew. And so write what you know is clearly critical, but in a way, there's no other choice, <laughs> if, unless you write a really bad book. <laughs> so tell us about the Vision Science Center, which is in the... Right, right. one of the issues here is I'm, I'm writing about NIH. I've been, I was at NIH as a research scientist for know, 45 years or so. And uh, it was my entire professional life as a, as a researcher was at NIH. and. As I'm writing this book, it started off, I started and uh, was still full-time science, 24-7 uh, as they say. I was working all the time and I didn't really know how, how I would have time to, to do this, to start writing because I was sort of annoyed at different things going on at NIH and I wanted to get it off my chest and I was going to write this, this book. And um, it, it turned out that <coughs> It turned out that it was uh, uh, really difficult to to, separate, to to start writing fiction, which it is, and not sort of get into the reality of what NIH was really like, because this is not these books. I was at NIH, it represents, I was at a National Eye Institute, which is not the vision science center of the book, but it's a derivative of that. And uh, it, it, it's truly, truly fiction. But again, uh, I don't know if, if there's any such thing as fiction, which isn't largely true as well. And so it, it, it's putting these things together, trying to be imaginative and interesting and saying what I'd like to say and let my mind float free. But uh, it, it's still, but instead of it being a science, involving science, uh, as we know it and as probably all of you think about it, I mean, science is what, as people say, well, it's facts, it's about nature, it's theories, it's all these things uh, trying to understand nature. And that's, that's true, of course it is. But in fact, uh, we can never really understand nature because there are too many variables, most of which we don't even know what they are. So what we're really doing as scientists is writing stories. We are, we are human constructions of the observations we make, trying to be consistent to write and actually call it science, which, which it is. So it's an attempt to be true, and the person say, yeah, but you know, I mean, DNA is a double helix, and that's true, so how can you be talking about it? Yes, that's true, DNA is a DNA, uh, double helix, and it's all factual. But it wasn't that way 200 years ago, and then it changed again But after that, and then it was a continuous line, and then it was proteins, and it wasn't that, and then it turned around to be a continuous line of nucleotides, and then it wasn't that, and then it turned out they were interrupted, and then it was a little bit different than that. So here this fact that we read says is the truth, this is nature. Now, how is it possible to have the truth of nature 
that changes every 15 or 20 years as new findings are, and it's something different. It obviously isn't a final fact. It's obviously going to change because it's our human construction at the time within, it, within the area that we understand and know. And it's a, it's a beautiful thing. It's like a piece of art. And it's imaginative. It's absolutely attempted to be the real thing, but it is not nature per se. It's a narrative that we have constructed that attempt to put nature in a way that we can understand better the world that we're living in as human beings. And that's, that's pretty much what, what it is. Yeah, it's really fascinating. It's, tr it's truth, you know, writing fiction, but telling the, you know, the truth on the one hand, and then also just what it takes to make a story in science is mm -hmm. a lot of, you know, you, you've explained it to me before, is you, know, you have certain facts or you observe certain things, but then you connect them with a narrative um, and sometimes that turns out to be right, and sometimes it's just speculative, and sometimes it's, um, you know, changes as you find more pieces to the story. Um, and so it's really, I feel like your, your grounding in science actually has given you sort of a, a leg up on being able to tell these kind of stories, because it is fluid and movable. The characters can go one way or they can go another way, just depending on what happens. But. So these books, which starts off with jellyfish of eyes, which by the way they do, jellyfish have <laughs> magnificent eyes. They have lenses, they have retinas, they have corneas. Not every species, they all have some ability to detect light, but certain species, and I spent quite a few years studying them, I got so excited, and they don't have much of a brain. So here you have an eye that's looking at you, but what the heck is it thinking about? I mean, you don't know it doesn't have a brain. So I sort of said, well, you know, the common idea in science that if you ask, an evolutionist, they said, well, well, how did an eye develop? How did, where did it come from? And they said, well, they get a brain, and then a brain it is an outpouching of the brain, and you have this construction of the eye with all its parts that it can see and bring information in, and that's true. It is an outpouching of the brain. But look at the jellyfish, which is the sort of the primordial animal supply theory. It's, no, no, no. The brain is an outpouching of the eye, <laughs> because the eye is seeing all the thing, and this Jellyfish is saying, well, like, what the hell do all this mean? So it puts together some kind of brain later on to figure out what it's seeing. I mean, but that kind of switch, well, is partially funny. I mean, it's meant to be a little bit of a, a joke. It's not a joke at all, because we think in linear terms, and really, which came first, which came from what, what was invented by nature, Separate, several times independently, which came in an evolutionary step. These are major, major questions really boiling down to who we are and who did we come from? What kind of ancestors did we have and how many and how did they come about? So let's take that and go to your primary uh, protagonist. Sort of oh, you asked me the question I wanted to say, oh, that, that the narrative, each of these books, it starts off in Jellyfish of Eyes. The narrative here, the book itself is testing the limits of the narrative of science. It starts off with real scientific facts of jellyfish that I know from my own work, et cetera. I mean, there's no question that the facts are the facts and what, what was observed, the observations. But then as Ricardo, the protagonist, is thinking about this and he's writing more and he's looking at it and his imagination is working, he's putting stories together in his mind and he sees things that he interprets in certain ways and he has visible evidence to do it. I mean, he doesn't, he truly believes this is it and it, he may very well be right, actually, I think he is but nobody else in the world thought he was. And so it's, the book is way, it is making science, science in the form of a narrative, but in a way it's testing the limits of how far can that narrative depart and still hold water as interesting and real science. And so that, that's what Yeah, what, so the, uh, I, the, the ideas of it are yeah. super interesting. I, I think we'll get back into the ideas. I wanted to talk, um, or I wanted you to talk about, you know, you mentioned Ricardo. Ricardo is obviously the main character in Jellyfish Have Eyes, mm -hmm. and also appears in this, the other two books in, first of all, as a sort of hologram, as a ghost hologram, and then in the final book, um, also as a presence. So, but, to, you know, before we get too deep into Ricardo, I wanted to say that the, the sort of one of the points of tension in Jellyfish is uh, his professional relationship 
So a lot of it looks at the nature of success and failure and how they're kind of two sides of one coin. And so he has a colleague called Benjamin, Ricardo's uh, colleague, and they're equals and colleagues, um, and yet there's a tension between them. Um, obviously their fate is very different. And so can you tell us just about the nature of that relationship and also you know, a little bit more about, we touched on the Vision Science Center, but it's, an eco, it's a whole ecosystem. It's got egos and ambition and vanity and pressure and pressure to publish and boredom and politics and um, <laughs> need to impress people, but here he is and this is his best friend. Well, we can talk a lot about that. My quandary here is I, I don't want to give away the book, <laughs> which is easy to do when one talks about it, otherwise to make it make sense. But, so I'll tell you a little bit, maybe that I shouldn't, but I will. The, um, uh, Benjamin is the best friend of Ricardo. Ricardo's an older man, actually, by the way. His wife has just died of cancer, and she made him promise on her deathbed in the first chapter already. And, it was, it was really very sad that, that she had pain and she was dying, and she said, please, please, you're the scientist. Do something to help people. Do something to help cancer. No, you're not cancer. Do something to help blindness, because this is your responsibility, and this is what you can do, and why should people have to suffer? And that made a deep impression on him, and he was in the center, which is oriented towards uh, medical and, and uh, doing help. But his real love was basic research, was research that I loved to find out not what's wrong with a disease, but what's right when things go well. Uh, uh, it was uh, basic research is, is people say go to medical school and they can do research, yes, but medical school, in fact, orients it in a certain way. Basic research takes you in another direction. If you find something that's interesting uh, in a, well, for example, if you find a regulatory agent of a gene that works in a jellyfish, which we were done, then uh, a scientist would say, oh, that's very, very interesting. Could we use that to help with cataracts, for example, if they're working? And it's very possible that it could be useful. But the basic researcher would ask himself, well, where did that come from? Did another animal have it? How did it evolve? Is it the same kind of switch that you find in other animals? And instead of going into a hospital to try to do medical research, you go into the swamps of Puerto Rico, like I did, to try to find out what that jellyfish is all about and about how it might have evolved. So there are like two different worlds that exist. And you can't say that one is more important than the other. Well, I mean, the medical research, but is clearly terribly important. <clears throat> And so that's another aspect of this, this book, particularly, but of all of them. And that is that the government is in a time of depression, as Johnny Fish and I started. The, the economy is terrible, the unemployment is high, they have limited funds, and so they have to use the money they have in the government to find medical cures, because that's so important. I mean, taxpayers deserve to be able to have their money directed towards something that will help them and not in 30 years. That's the truth, this was a good government, but yet, by putting all the money within medical research, the basic researcher who is doing fundamentally terribly important work but doesn't have a destination, it doesn't do it to cure a particular disease, it does it to understand genes better, to understand whatever it is better. It's a different world, and it's not going to help anyone immediately. So the money doesn't really can go there. The basic researcher gets starved out. So this is the first book that I can think of. I've read a lot of books, or a number of books, on despond of governments that are dy dystopian. I mean, they're, they're governments that, that are oppressive. We all know about oppressive governments. I mean, does anybody take the Washington Post? You know all about oppressive governments. Mm -hmm. However, what book have you, any of you read that's about a truly good government with real causes that are justifiable and, and noble and turn out to be oppressive in certain ways? And that's what this is in a way. This is the, the sake that how careful you have to be because even goodness has its oppressive side. Yeah. Not everything which is just my intention is great, therefore it's great. It doesn't work that way. So this goes into the whole politics at the Vision Science Center. Yeah. So there's tracks, you know, there's a sort of safe track 
which is doing medically justifiable research. Right. And then there's the wild track, which is just discover something and then see where it takes you. And that may turn out to be medically necessary or medically, um, what's the word, medically significant relevant. or relevant, medically relevant. Or it may not, it may be completely something different, but something really amazing might be learned from it. So anyway, back to Benjamin. Yeah, so back to the question you asked. So Benjamin was his best friend, and they went out to hunt jellyfish together, and they were equal partners. And it was a wonderful relationship. And in a way, it was taken from a very close friend of mine, and I went out to the swamps in Puerto Rico to hunt for jellyfish with my friend, who was not named Benjamin, but he was my friend from UCLA. And uh, that was real. But then in the novel, and this is now all, all fiction, it gets to be, while they're equal, eventually, Benjamin and is doing work that's also kind of far out there, not like jellyfish vision. He's working on cactus or something. He had discovered something, and he wasn't telling anybody. He was also doing kind of basic findings and looking for something. But that gets to be more recognized, and he gets elected to important societies, uh, like the National Academy of Science. This way it was called in the book, the American Academy of Science. And, and so, um, he becomes a, sort of a big shot. And Ricardo, who is really the same elk, the same everything, he, he doesn't get that. And he's a very ambitious guy in addition to everything else. And so... Uh, he's in fact vilified. Yeah, and it, 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 he, gets, it, he gets separated more and more and he gets vilified. And so there's this tension that develops because it's still his friend, but they're not equal anymore. And in a way that sort of represents the reality, in my opinion, of basic science and science today that goes on, yes, everyone says it's so wonderful to be out there studying nature and it's all ideal, but really we're all people and there's a lot of intercompetition, there's a lot of jealousy that goes on, there's a lot of effort that people do to get recognition to go further. And that just exists, then you have to live with it as the separation goes by. And it, it's very hard, it's very hard to to deal with this constant because science is really no different than, than anything else in the business because it is the study of nature, it is the study of things outside of yourself, but you cannot run away from your own skin. You are a human being and we're all in a sense wanting recognition, we're all wanting to succeed in certain ways, and it becomes unequal, and then there's, there's political aspects, and it goes on and on, and I can speak for a long time about that, but the idea is very clear, that that's a reality. And so all three of these books deal with both issues. They deal with the, the ideal nature, they deal with the uh, all aspects of it, but at the same time it deals with the introspective life of a scientist that's living, uh, for himself, and for others, and for nature, the, the inner life of what it is to be a science. I had a friend of mine who, who read the second book, Rogers Thought Particle, we'll get to, and uh, he, he, read, he read the book, he's a scientist himself, and he said, oh, John, this is really interesting, I just read the story of my life. <laughs> and he is, happens to be a nephrologist, <laughs> a basic scientist, a, a medical doctor. So it, it's really together, it's the life of a basic scientist in a fictional way, in a way that is using, combining imagination, fiction, but absolute reality. I, I never believed in this, significant separation between fiction and reality anyway. Well, and, the, and also the separation between success and failure. Success and failure. So how, how they are exactly the same. But then it turns <laughs> out in the book that things get twisted a little yeah, bit. There's so. always a twist that makes yeah. it different you should, than you, you thought. Should, you should leave the twist. So, leave that, so, so, that, that, so that, when that, you're turning yeah. pages at 11 o'clock at night and you want to go to bed, but i got to find out what happened. Yeah. So anyway, so it is two sides of a coin. And the politics is is, you know, Jordan's done a really beautiful job of getting into the sort of office politics uh, at the Vision Science Center. But um, let's talk about um, the, the protagonist of the second book, Roger. Um, and Roger is a descendant of Ricardo. And unlike Ricardo, who's kind of gone the wild path with his basic research, um, doing things that are not um, necessarily going to end up in a cure, for a disease, Roger has taken the safe track. And Roger's on the tenure track, 
he's, uh, he's reaping the benefits, yeah, it's reap the benefits of his medically relevant publications on macular degeneration. He's, but he's bored and he's frustrated and he's sort of at a breaking point and then um, he, he does something that would seem to, that it would drive his career off course, but actually has the opposite effect. Um, so he, he, he has a te temper, a fit of temper. And um, it's actually, uh, turns out that instead of costing him politically, paradoxically. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, this is, this is me and my craziest self. Um, people in general worry, he was, Roger, who was actually the great, great grandson, a long time, many generations of Ricardo, which was of the first book. And the reason for that distance which is 100 years or so, is because it's now a different era. And so the idea was, in a sense, to show the impact of the era that you're living in and whether things are going to be successful or not uh, with what you're actually doing. Because you could be doing the same thing in one era that's a complete failure in another era. So by writing these books in slightly different eras, there's an ability to compare similar kinds of things that receive very different results. And so that's... that's part of that. And so what happened when he decides he figured he's having dinner, Roger's having dinner with his friend, and he was saying, you know, I just feel I'm stuck on the shore. I mean, the tide's going in and out, and I'm just a shell that's dying, and I'm not getting anywhere, and it's kind of hopeless. He was discouraged the way I would say 99.9% .9 of the scientists are when their experiments don't work. And so uh, he said, ah, oh, but I have an idea, he said. I, I wonder if we can, I know, how do you determine whether you are a success? I mean, what? And so he thought, uh, well, okay, here's my harebrained scheme. My way is that I think you can do it is, it takes you so many years to develop a reputation. So it may work 10 years and you've got a reputation of being a very bright guy and good at one thing or another. Fine, now I want to know how long is it going to take you to destroy that reputation? So if it takes me eight years to destroy a reputation that I built up in 10 years, it's pretty solid reputation. But what if I destroy it in one year? What if I destroy it in one day? I do something and suddenly for 10 years people thought that I was somebody and in one day it's all gone. That was a pretty weak reputation I had. I couldn't withstand very much. So he started insulting people. He started figuring to do this. I mean, the guy was kind of crazy, and he, he started doing that, and he would just blow up at people and really be nasty to them, but every time he did that, people said, just something must be wrong. Is he having trouble at home? I don't understand, and they were nicer to him, and then they started awarding him awards for things, maybe, because they figured that, uh, you know, maybe he needs a little boost or whatever it is. So it, it, everything worked in reverse, and I think it, 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 it turns out that it was, he was very successful. I mean, the more he insulted, the higher he went. You know, kind of like Trump, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, but that, that was his personality. So in a way, all of these books reflect my, my twisting things. My, maybe I got that from my father. Uh, my memoir is called, um, uh, Speed of Dark. Yeah, <laughs> That's a different book. The Speed of Dark. <laughs> the Speed of Dark. And that, that came from, in a sense, ultimately my father. When I was from high school, uh, college, I came back. I had taken a course in physics. And I told him, you so, I was so proud of myself. I said, nothing goes faster than the speed of light. My father was a musician. He was not a scientist in any way. He said, speed of light. He said, yeah, I mean, how, why is it that there is a limit to how fast anything can go? It's very fast, but I, I, isn't that amazing? And he looked at me and he said, well, what about the speed of dark? <laughs> <laughs> and that was standard, my father, his ability to look at things and see them in another way. And really, to me, that was the heart of creativity in many ways, because everything we know and see and order in a certain way, and particularly those people who insist they're right because that's the way it is, especially in those cases, yeah, but if you just turn a little bit, if you have a little bit of perspective difference, and these books try to reflect that. 
So Roger, when he does turn, um, he's, he, he's frustrated by the sort of politics at the Vision Science Center, and particularly in one scene uh, called the study section, is, um, and the, the sort of eminent scientists are sitting around deciding whose project is going to be funded and whose research is going to be recognized and who's going to get grants. And, um, and it's, a, it's a lovely piece of political observation. But Roger um, realizes that, you know, this is terribly biased and people from big name universities or big um, fancy uh, research programs are getting, um, are getting the money. And so he blows up um, and loses his temper. But, uh, you know, unlike Ricardo, Roger's story is success. So he's already successful following the conventional path. And then he loses his, his temper and is unpleasant to people and becomes more successful. And then he um, comes up with a, a sort of interesting, this is the thought particles hypothesis, which is um, you know, where thoughts are actually physical things that can infect, almost infect people, that they're not just ideas, that they're actually substance. And so this is his big piece of scientific breakthrough. But even then, it's not really something that he can prove or that is likely to be proven in his lifetime, but Roger pulls it out by um, turning to uh, religion where it doesn't matter whether it can be proved. It's a question of belief. So there's some discussion about ideas and how they're transmitted and also whether this is a, a you know, whether it matters for, for him. He just seems to land on his feet in a way that um, his, his ancestor didn't. Um, so did, did you, when you were writing about Roger, did you set out to make him the sort of inverse of Ricardo? And then the other thing I wanted to ask you as well is they're connected, they're family. What is it about Ricardo that Roger is so drawn to? Because there's obviously such different characters. Yeah, well, it, it really, um there was no attempt to make an inverse of uh, Roger. It was just, it's another book. In fact, it's it's interesting. It's a trilogy by accident, one might say. I, had, um, I wrote Jellyfish of Eyes, and as far as I was concerned, I wrote this novel. But then I wanted to write another novel, and my mind kept drifting to that, and so I, I somehow put things together, and I never didn't know if it'd work or not. I wasn't sure, but I came up with Roger Thought Particles that I'll tell you about in a minute. And then a um, little time went by, and I, I again wanted to write something else, and I didn't quite know, so uh, I thought about this again a little bit. So I, it didn't in uh, Regina's Imagination Universe. I didn't but at all begin to st sit down and say, I want to write a trilogy. That, that didn't exist. I mean, these, these things sort of fell together, in a sense, by accident. And uh, I think a lot of writing does that. In fact, um, I mean, I'm sure a lot of you have written, and. Um, uh, find that things don't, they, they work by accident, they come together because you're the same person and similar ideas come out. But in, in Roger's thought particle, the, the idea he had it was, well, you, in the book he, through studying, there was a pandemic, because that was the time it was writing, and in the pandemic, he interviews a lot of the survivors and comes to certain conclusions, which uh, one can read about, but the conclusions that he had were very imaginative, very, very far out, and that, that's exactly similar to what happened to Ricardo. He was studying jellyfish, and he came to certain conclusions, like uh, that they can visualize evolution. That's what Ricardo said, and he had evidence that they could actually see, looking at another animal, the entire evolutionary history of that animal. I mean, that's, that's wild. It was like you could see it, but there's, there's reason he had evidence for that. And so, Roger was a big fan of Ricardo because he had read about him. He didn't know him. He was <coughs> Ricardo was long dead, but he also was starting to use his imagination about things he had heard. He came to the conclusion that thoughts between people are actually can be transferred as particles. When you're thinking about something, it's always thought of, and it probably it's an abstraction. It's not particular. You can't say this piece of chocolate is a thought. It's a piece of chocolate. 
But his idea was because when he fought people who had survived through the pandemic, they were adopting the thoughts of the people who were their caretakers or their spouses who were right close to them. And he couldn't understand how that could happen. There were too many cases, but only the people that were close to him, they kind of, he suddenly became uh, thinking like they did without them trying to convince him at all, not talking about it. And so the idea was that thoughts could, in fact, be particles like a virus, like a uh, infection. So you go into a room and you, you have uh, some people there and they're thinking about things and you can be infected. You can catch the flu, you can catch COVID, you can catch John Burdick's sitting here, his thought <laughs> that just comes. So it's it, very, it, it's it became very realized that, that this is very important because this is the first study that was ever done that showed in science in his mind, and he had evidence for it, that an abstraction, a complete abstraction, could actually be particulate. It could be concrete. It wasn't abstract, and it affected everything. I mean, what does that do to free will? What does that do when you go home and you have this great idea and you gotta do something, but you don't even know it wasn't your idea, you were infected by some other person, then you don't even know who infected you, perhaps, because you didn't even know the person, but the infection, you just happened to get infected. And so, then we say, but then the twist comes, and this is on the role of destiny, which is throughout these books, the twist comes when nobody believes his, his ideas, even though there are physical reasons one might defend it, which, I, which are fascinating in reality, but in any case, uh, he, um, uh, what was I going to say? Uh, it is thought to slip my mind. A twist. Um, a twist. Yeah, so uh, he's interviewed and it's written in the New York Times what this idea is. And a rabbi happens to read the Science uh, Times. He reads the New York Times and he says, God, this is really a rabbi. I mean, this guy didn't know the person at all and he didn't know what was going on. And the rabbi said, please come to our congregation and give a talk on it. It's so fascinating. And so his wife, Robin, didn't want him to do that because he's not a religious person. He's not a, I mean, this is ridiculous. He's a scientist. He would make a fool of himself. But he just was tempted. And he went and he gave and then it, got, it caught on. And he started working with the rabbi to spread this idea around and it had major beneficial effects. And he ended up becoming a huge success and known in this entirely different field in terms of religion of all things. From his thought as a metaphor. Completely opposite and from so the science. He became a big success while, puts this crazy idea, while Ricardo ended up basically in jail because of his ideas, and they were just, he was spending, squandering government money, two different things. But he was, in a sense, what is an accidental success right. because he was a success in a field that he didn't intend to be a success in. So he was still a failure in what he wanted to do, but he was a success by accident in what he didn't necessarily want to and do. And he was a success when he was trying to fail. <laughs> so so it, it, it's playing with destiny. You never know your destiny. How it can change without knowing. How it's not up to you, really. It's up to what you're exposed to, and it uh, it's kind of a free-for-all out there. Yeah. And also the importance of being really open-minded to ideas, because they're not, you know, mm. you don't know where they're going to take you. Right. And, and you really don't. And which ones are really going to catch on, or which ones are, are worth pursuing, or which ones are true. So anyway, just to d digress a bit, one of the things that I really enjoy about Joram's writing is that Joram has a way of telling stories that are very, you know, you sort of go along and you're reading them, and, and then all of a sudden they take a dramatic turn in a completely different direction that you think, whoa. <laughs> and, and so this is one of them. His, some of his short stories are like that as well, but they end up in a completely different place than you envisioned. And so um, I guess we should move on to um, Regina, the final character. But before we get really into Regina, I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about the genetic, because you know the title of the book that you um, you co-edited is you know genes, vision, and, o and ocular disease, and so you've studied genetics a lot. Why did you choose to have the 
three main characters be related or be descendants of each other? And what is a you know what do you feel about sort of nature versus nurture and <laughs> and, 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 and their particular relationship? Can you explain how they're connected and why you chose to connect? It, it, it wasn't any kind of brilliant choice. I mean, they, they just. They were just born, <laughs> and so it, it, it happened. But um, but it is an interesting question: to what extent are our genes really uh, the basis for how we are and how we think and what we do? Which, of course, they are to a large extent, but not a total extent. And to what extent is it the environment that trains you and, and shapes you and makes you that way? So this question of nature versus nurture, it's I mean it's it's just age-old question. We don't have the answer to that because the answer is, well, certainly both. I mean, genes are activated by the environment and so forth and so on. So uh, it, it's, it's within the books and it is discussed and um, uh, it, it's an important question that is, but it, it, it's hard to come to a conclusion about that. So it's left, it's left open. So Regina, you, how did you come to, to so Regina came along, and at this point I realized this is the last book that I wanted it to be a trilogy. And so I had a real problem, because if it's going to be a trilogy, something has to, just like any good novel, you want the character to somehow be changed throughout the book so that it's a slightly different character at the end of the book than before the book. There's been change that's happened. There's been some kind of progression. I mean, it's the same character all the way through and the end's the same. It's kind of boring. So you want the change to be part of the book. Well, when you write a trilogy, without even knowing quite what I was going to write about exactly, I wanted to somehow wrap up the other two books. And these other two books were really, I mean, a real problem. I took me a a lot of thinking of how can I wrap it up and I, and I didn't know if I would be able to. But what I thought about it was that really um, the, uh, the basis of the work of Ricardo on the jellyfish was his extraordinary imagination. And then comes along the second book, his great-great-grandson, the basis of his thought particles of an abstraction become concrete well, that was very imaginative. I mean, there are not many people who would think about that or say the way the way whole book it works out. I mean, it's not just I say that and therefore it's a theory. It, it, it's shown how he develops the theory and why he has evidence in it and how there could be evidence. And some of the evidence he has is actually true in today's science. So uh, it wasn't that simple. But how am I going to wrap up these two things, which are seemingly unrelated? So I figured, or I should say Regina figured, she was the... Uh, granddaughter of Roger, who was in the second book. And her parents she didn't like very much. They were not terribly good parents, but she was crazy about her, grand, her grandfather. He was, and her grandfather was Roger, who was now an old man. He was 90 years old. When she graduated from college, he was there. She was, she, she, the book ends, she's still a young woman. But she she's, loves to write fiction and stories, and she loves science beyond everything. And when she went to school, she mixed the two. It's again mixing of everything. She graduated with honors from Princeton by writing a short story as an example of her science ideas. <laughs> so she was presenting science in fictional ways in the forms of stories, and she actually did very well that way. She was a very interesting very intelligent, very ambitious, very open person. And um, I, was, I, was, I really liked her. <laughs> she was a wonderful girl. And so uh, she was thinking about this until it became clear to her the importance of imagination. Because everyone says in science, and this is true today, oh, ideas, there are does, a dime a dozen. I mean, you can, you got to prove your idea. And if you don't prove your idea, you don't have real evidence, then, you know, I mean, that's fine, and sorry, at a good time, but it's not really science. So the question became, what's the role of imagination in science? And that's not an easy one to answer. And so she was thinking about it and thinking about it, and uh, all of this, again, is introspection of the scientist at work. And she finally came to a conclusion, which is in the last chapter, it's all worked out, um, she came to the conclusion that 
Imagination is an extraordinary thing that we all have, everybody, to some extent, but to various extent, and there's a real world out there. There's an imagination universe out there. There's a reality universe which is not connected with the human being at all. It's just out there, whatever it is. And she was thinking about these two worlds we inhabit, and she realized, you know, if imagination, something is interesting, like a thought being a particle, which in fact is interesting because thoughts can come out as, as energy from a person when they're thinking, and elementary particles are really just condensed energy, and elementary particles are called particles, and they could actually penetrate a mind, and they could set things off. And there's a physical basis even today to think of something as imagination or energy in a particular form, and they do. I mean, that's, that's quantum mechanics is phenomenally interesting that way. So in any case, she started thinking, it meant proof of an imaginative idea is a different field. I mean, it could be a technical accomplishment. Somebody had a wonderful idea, and somebody else proved it and gets the Nobel Prize as a great scientist. But what about this guy who had the imagination that didn't prove a thing? But the imagination itself got people thinking it was interesting. It may not have been proved. It may not have even been right, but it guided people to what might be right or wrong. So the imagination of these so-called failures of scientists in the background were actually visionary, wonderful, important scientists, and they should get imagination rewards for that, and that there are two areas to science. There's imagination and there's proof, and they are actually separate, and sometimes they join and sometimes they don't, but they always interact. And so that was how she put the whole thing together. And that also became very interesting because that raises the question then which you might ask me next. Well, what about reality? And that was a real concern. She was asked, actually by Roger and Ricardo, the ghosts who were in the book, she was asked, well, what about what's reality? And so she was thinking, you know, there's the imagination universe and the reality universe, and they overlap. We don't inhabit just one universe. We inhabit both universes, but everybody's imagination is in fact different because some people have more, some people have less, and in fact, uh, past experiences are all gonna contribute to your imagination, and everybody has different past experiences. So no one's gonna have the identical imaginative universe in them. They're all looking at the same reality, but if they're overlapping, they will see that reality a little differently depending on how their imagination takes them. And there are so many things that people look at and it's the same thing, and they have something different to say about it. They see it differently, and that's their reality. So she comes to the conclusion and develops, in a sense, a physics of psychology that you have to, this prism, like Newton separated white light into all the colors of the rainbow with the prism by separating all the different components in white light. You'd have to do the same thing for reality to separate all the different components of the person's reimaginative and the reality itself to get some idea of the complexity and what reality is. So there are personal realities for each person, but there's no absolute reality outside of the reality itself, but not for human beings. Yeah, and that imagination is a universe. That, and it, it is a universe. It's it's a whole universe, and there's even a sense of a sense like we have, we have taste receptors, we have thermoreceptors, we have all kinds of receptors that we depend on. That's how we sense the world. And so she said, there's even an imagination sense in everyone that gets this somehow. They respond to it like they do to heat or cold, and that's going to affect the reality for them, because it overlaps and they can't separate it. And then she realizes that Ricardo and Roger are, in a sense, alive, because, and this is sort of how you tied up the trilogy, um, that they're in her imagination, and if they're in your imagination, they're real. They're real. They yeah. exist, and they continue to exist. Yeah. And, and real imagination, I mean, <laughs> in a sense, nothing's ever finished. So what sounds crazily imagined of one day, yeah, but maybe in 10 years, maybe in 100 years, maybe in 300 years, it might turn out to be quite right. So you can never say that there isn't a reality in imagination. It's just not possible to say it. You can say we don't have it now. So it's 
So just, um, I think we'll probably turn it over to questions yeah. in a minute, but just last thought, um, that uh, I believe that you are still writing, and I believe that you're still intrigued by the character of Regina, is that correct? Are you, how, yeah. are you giving, I, I mean, and how do you put these characters down, I, I suppose, when you, you know, when you've written, I mean, this is just months and months and months and months of writing and revising and thinking and thinking about these characters and their stories and their lives and their, you know, the, how the three books will fit together. When you sit down and you have the book and it's in the covers, obviously it's like the imagination universe. That book is a universe in itself, but it's not finished. Once you once you you know have it published, you're still thinking like, what are these characters doing, or should I pick up a thread from this character or that character? How do you yeah. how do you feel about that? Well, it's it's a really tough question. I mean, I guess we've all everyone here has probably asked that. When is enough? When is enough? I mean, there is no answer to that because it's never enough. I'm. I'm a collector of Inuit art, and just when I know I should stop collecting, another piece out there looks so great, maybe I should buy that too. I mean, when is it enough? And so it's the same with writing, I mean, um, but Regina uh, was, I don't know, she might have been 30 years old when the book ends, and there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot there that we could develop, and so I'm, I'm working on that and combining a lot of different things. I mean, I want you to really talk about that until one knows it a little bit better. But one, one of the ideas is that she's really a clear portrait of what kind of person she is. And she has a best friend who really knows her very well. And so I'm working on the idea that, that everything that Regina seemed to be was not correct. <laughs> She really was a very different person, but she she was much more complex. And that complexity and the reasons for it are what I'm working on right now. But you know, I mean, I never know if anything's going to work out. No, nothing I've ever written, and there's lots of short stories I say. I've never had anything end the way I meant it to end, because it develops as it goes along, and the characters turn out to be quite different than I thought they would be, and. Every one of them is, is part of me. I mean, I, I can't help that. And uh, I'm embarrassed sometimes because I don't want to be that part, but <laughs> <laughs> I am. So that's the beauty of fiction. You know, in, in fiction, and why I think it's so real, is that you're not writing a biography, you're not doing research on what a person lived like, you're not doing history on about something, you're not writing about a, a particular event that took place. You've got a blank, now scream instead of a piece of paper, a blank scream on top of it. And you just want to write everything. <laughs> and you've got nothing to say, to look at, and say, I want to do a little more research to find what this is or that. It all has to be kind of what's inside of me. And then you do a little research to find out certain things you think about, of course. But, um, but it's very challenging. And, uh, and since it, it has to be part of you, because there's nobody else there to take the blame. <laughs> and so um, uh, it's real. I mean, so fiction is real, but a little bit more mixed up. So do, does anyone want to ask anything or observations for Dora or questions? Yeah. 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 Do you have any, uh, are there any authors that like, influence your style or? You just kind of go off on your own and try to find your own voice? Or? Well, as far as the voice is concerned, you mentioned that, the voice. I mean, I, I, I don't think you can, I don't think you should try to develop a voice. I mean, a voice is something that develops by being authentic, and you don't, I mean, to me it wouldn't be a sincere voice. So there's no, no author that I want to be like or anything like that. But um, uh, you know, I've liked a lot of different authors. Initially, I really liked, uh, I, I really liked, um, oh, uh, Ka I liked Kafka a lot because he was totally hopeless. I mean, he would just be <laughs> going, you know, he would go on and on and on, and I mean, to stay awake through all of that thing. But, um, and, and I liked 
Proust actually a lot because uh, when I was writing my memoir, it was discouraging in the sense that my life has been boring. I mean, you know, I mean, I've got a good job. I had wonderful parents. I have enough to live on. I have a fabulous wife. I have good kids. I mean, who the heck wants to know about that? I mean, it's a, it's a bore, you know? I mean, I, and uh, other people go off to war and they do like, I never was in war, thank God. And so then I read Proust. And he's the first guy that I, I ever read that I think was really more boring than me. I mean, he was just, he just lay in bed his whole life. He was as erotic as could be. He was, you know, stuck between his, his homosexuality and one thing or another. I mean, it's just like God in those salons, which were just impossible to take. And the books are great. And I realized that, you know, it doesn't matter what you've done. It matters what you think about. It matters how you filter whatever you see, that there is no such thing as a boring person. There's just things about boring thoughts. And so that was very in inspiring to me because I, I really believe that, I mean, I believe that um, did have an influence on me, definitely, and Kafka did too, in terms of the, you know, the hopelessness of it all. And it is, in a sense, it, it's hopeless and it isn't, but. So you really started working on, or? Yeah, very Yeah. Um, just out of curiosity, why did you choose a woman for your third book? Why is it Regina and uh, Eugene? Yeah, why not? Was there a Why not reason to Thomas. put a female figure into your or, trilogy? Or Philip. Um, well, I, I, um, I thought it would be fun to write about a, a woman. I mean, and uh, I also wrote about a woman in uh, Rogers. Uh, he marries Robin, and she's really a nice, interesting person, too. And uh, Lillian, who was the wife who died of the, Ricardo, she died, but it was in his m mind the, the whole, throughout the book, because he was really, he loved her very much, but there's a whole story that develops from that. And so, uh, I mean, it, it was also, it was fun to write about Regina. Yeah. It's a different thinking, I guess, a little bit. We were talking ahead of this about, um, you know, what, what it takes to you know, develop a voice as a writer. And I had seen some Miles Davis quote saying, man, something like, man, it takes a lot, it took a long time to sound like myself. <laughs> and so I know with Durham, it was sort of, you decided, and this is really, you know, kind of wonderful, as you were in your science career, to, that you wanted to start writing. And so you started writing short stories, first of all, and then essays, and you know, how long did you have to sort of write yourself into your style through these? Did, did, did you start with the short things and then move up to the novel, or? No, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it, those are all really big questions. I, uh, Lona and I, I were on vacation in Maine in 1995, and I was in full science mode. I mean, I was working 24/7 science with my whole life, but I always wanted to write, just, but I write a lot of science, but I wanted to, because for me, science was like painting an image in a way, and the, all the work you do goes together. I, I didn't work helter-skelter, I mean, everything kind of worked together to build an image. And I decided when we were on a hunt in Maine, <coughs> uh, on a hike in Maine, uh, Lono was uh, gonna paint, uh, something she had in her backpack, and she sat in a beautiful spot overlooking a bay. And I'd had a pen and pen, uh, pen uh, some paper, and I was going to move a, a few trees away and, and write something to start writing because I've always wanted to write. And I must have sat there for one hour. I had no idea what to write about, absolutely none. I mean, it's fine to talk about, it's another thing to actually try to do it. And so different thoughts went through my mind, one thing and another, and no, not that, not that, not that. And then it suddenly dawned on me that this is science. I mean, when I went as a graduate student into the lab and I was supposed to do research, I had no idea what to do research on. I mean, the lab was doing certain things, but there's an infinite number of possibilities. I just didn't know. 
And so it, finally I realized it doesn't matter. You just got to start and just see how it goes. And I, there are certain things that are more in your mind. Some things you're just interested in, other things you're not. I, I never knew why. I mean, why would somebody be interested in science and not business when they're both fascinating? I don't know why, but that's what happened. So it was the same thing here in writing in Maine. So I figured I was at that point collecting Inuit art or starting to more or less. <clears throat> so I was wrote about a little boy who um, went as an exchange. He went to the Arctic and he went hunting with a caribou with an, uh, with an Inuit boy. And they went out on the trail and it was totally, totally imagined. There was nothing in my mind. And I wrote about three pages and I just fell in love with both of these guys and I just, it was, it was so, I gave, it was like giving birth he to people. I, I, there were people just like, there were these guys here, I mean, they're characters in the book, but they're part of my family now. They're part of your imagination part universe. Of me, yeah. And so, uh, that really happened, but then comes the question when you're so busy in science, which is terribly time consuming, how am I going to make time to do this? I want to continue writing. And so I figured what I would do is I, I wrote an essay on the cracks of time, the idea was that I would write in cracks of time. So I was terribly busy at work with all kinds of things in science. But if I had like an hour, if I had guests coming to dinner at six and it was 4.30 and it was pretty much done, I would start writing and I would never even attempt to finish anything. It just, there's no time. I mean, then you get sucked in. It's like doing sit-ups. You want to get in good shape, so you do five sit-ups and then I'm going to do 10 sit-ups. Then I'm going to do 50 sit-ups, then I'm going to do 75 sit-ups, and then you never do another sit-up in the rest of your life because it's too exhausting. But if you just did 10 sit-ups every time, you would stay in pretty good shape doing your 10 sit-ups. You don't have to do everything. And that's how it was with, with writing for me. So I started writing all kinds of things, little things that were never finished, but it built a whole portfolio of sort of unfinished, unpublishable things <laughs> that 12 years ago, and I'm still, I'm still working on some of those today. I mean, you kind of created a, a base, and it didn't affect my science because it didn't take any time. It was cracks of time here and there. Did you know when you started the book that it would be a book, or did you just think that you were just filling in, a in, crack and in writing a short story? Yeah, when I started that. Well, I sort of wanted to write a book, but I had no idea. I mean, I thought it might be a novella, but uh, I, I didn't. I didn't know. I didn't know who would be anything. <laughs> yeah. Are there are there a lot of writers? Yes. So you mentioned Jordan. That, uh, success is a complicated business because yeah. it's often conferred from outside, but and we have to measure those whatever metrics that say you're successful. And the people who say you're successful can maybe withdraw that judgment, but people on day you commit some horrible crime. What about satisfaction? Do you feel satisfied as a writer? Well, that's. So the question is, am I satisfied with my writing? Yes. Um, well, I was last Wednesday afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, it, um, on the whole, yes. I mean, when I started, when I closed my lab in 2009, actually, I was just about 70, not quite 70 years old, and I'd never written any, any fiction or anything like that before. I accepted completely the fact that I really wanted to do this and I almost certainly would fail. I mean, a lot of people told me that I would, you know, you're too old, you're not going to think like a, a writer, it's terribly competitive, no one's going to publish you, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I realized that was true. So I, I kind of accepted that and the fact that I actually have been able to write quite a lot of stuff that I think is, is authentic for me. I mean, everything I wrote is really what who I am. So I am satisfied that I could do that. Yeah. That's great. Uh, so I, I'm pleased about that. You know, one can always write better. I hope my next book is better, but you know, one tries one's best. Okay. Great. So there'll be a 10 minute exam. <laughs> Yeah, don't forget if you want to uh, receive it. Oh yeah, that's right. Uh, that yeah. there's um, there's a sheet here where you can put your email address, and um, they'll send you a link that you can get 
of this audiobook, Truth and Fantasy, which is 67 short essays that I wrote in the book, and then I actually spent a year making the audio. I actually did all the audio work myself, which was a whole new education. I mean, do you know how torture it is to read the same two pages 25 times <laughs> and say, no, this word was not clear, and then I go again and again and again. It's murder. But anyway, the book is done, so if you want to get it, you can just yeah. put your email address. It's free. Um, and, and it also, more, it also if just anybody goes wants to, to buy any of these, I mean, this is not meant yes, to be Yes, they will be for sale. Yeah, they'll be. Um, there's a, it's also interesting that, you know, your writing has spawned the audio career as well. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, so, it's hard, but yeah, it's a different career. Really we, one thing leads to another. Right. So. so thank you very much all for listening. And thank you.